Thanks for joining in today, everyone, and welcome. I'm Joe Belmonte with Environmental Construction Solutions, and today I'm both the host and presenter, and we'll be talking about fertilizer options on construction job sites, but always a bit of housekeeping before we get started. You'll see a chat box uh, on your screen there. Uh, chime in and let us know where you're joining from today and ask questions in the chat box, and I'll address them at the end. We'll also have information at the end to allow you to get a PDH, a uh, professional development hour for watching today. Um, we already have some folks saying hello and letting us uh, know where they're from. I appreciate that. Um, and so getting right started uh, into what I like to call paying the bills. Um, those of you that have been on a webinar before have seen this. I like to take a minute uh, for those new folks and, and kind of uh, say a few words about who we are and what we do. Um, you, you can see from our product line in this picture, uh, I like to say we can help from start to finish, but really it's even more than that. We can help from the design side all the way through post-construction on a project. Um, and anything you may have uh, help with in the erosion and settlement control and stormwater world, we can certainly um, get you the answers, or if we don't know, we can help you find out. Um, Environmental Construction Solutions is part of the W.S. Conley family of companies. We have several um, uh, sister companies in the turf and ornamental world and Chesapeake Valley Seed, a, a seed company that deals a lot in native and reclamation mixes. Um, we've been around since the 1950s and we're uh, you know big enough to serve you and small enough to want to, as I like to say. Um, we've got about 120 people on staff. Uh, we're well known in the Mid-Atlantic and Ohio River Valley for our excellent customer service, our rapid delivery, and our product knowledge. And uh, a little bit about me, since I'm the speaker today, um, you know, I've got over 20 years of experience in the construction supply industry with a majority of that time in um, seeding and vegetative establishment and erosion control. I'm a certified fertilizer applicator in Virginia, um, very specific to today's topic. Um, I am also uh, um, certified as a erosion control and stormwater program manager by Virginia DEQ. I've spoken at national and regional IECA events and contributed to industry magazines like Stormwater. So let's go ahead and um, just kind of get started here and really, really jump right into things and, and talk, start talking about what we're going to mention today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about soil testing and why, why that's important. Um, I like to harp on that. If you've ever heard uh, me talk about vegetation or, or um, job sites before, and we're going to try to put those things today in, in parameters of a job site and how that's different from, say, your home garden or your uh, home lawn. We're going to talk about synthetic versus uh, orga organic fertilizers. And in doing so, we'll get into a little bit about micro and, and macronutrients and, and, the, and understanding pH and why that's important. Um, also, some fertilizer applications on job sites. We'll talk a little bit about liquid uh, fertilizer. And um, then we have some uh, questions and answer at the end. Um, so, you, you know, just an overview. We're not going to really get into the... Um, uh, really chemistry of fertilizers or, you know, we're not going to talk about nitrification or volatization or, or really things deep into the weeds on, on uh, the science behind a lot of this. What this is going to be is more uh, the differences between the types of fertilizer while they may uh, work on your, your, um, your, wet, your job site and, and which one might be best for you and how you can help, uh, excuse me, how you can uh, decide on your own which one might be the best for your job site or how we might can help you. And so just uh, starting out, you know, an ideal soil profile, if you think back to earth science, which I think is eighth or ninth grade, um, there's a, if you look at the picture on the left there, there's a topsoil and a subsoil and a substratum. And typically vegetation is grown and fertilization is done mostly in the horizons O and A, maybe a little bit in the in the subsoil and horizon B. Um, but as you know, we'll talk about later on, a lot of times what is on job sites is not actually topsoil at all, but more subsoil. Um, and uh, 
We can also look at the chart on the right that tells us the importance of air and water. You know, organic matter is 4% of, uh, of uh, the ideal soil profile. And then the minerals, um, for lack of a better word, let's call it dirt, um, make up a, a big point portion. But what a lot of folks forget is that air and water are just as important at, you know, 50% of an ideal soil profile. So if you can imagine, um, uh, holding up a, a, um, or, or grabbing a handful of soil from your backyard or your garden, or even a, a, a you know, potted, uh, raised bed, um, you know, 50% of that needs to be air and water. Now you don't see that obviously when it's in your hand, but the water gets in and the air and the pore space and why that's important for us today, is, as we talk about construction job sites, as we talk a lot about compaction and as you drive machinery over uh, soil over and over again, those soils get compacted and the air can't get um, in the, uh, the pore space, there's no pore space for air or water to get into, and that water just sheets off and causes er causes erosion. And of course, you know that's why we're here. Um, so a little bit of fertilizer up in uh, 101, up, down, all, and around is something great to remember. Um, 10, 10, 10 is the guaranteed analysis on this fertilizer bag. And so if most folks have bought a, a bag of fertilizer before, maybe at a box store or at a garden center, or, or if, you know, we have folks on here that are working on job sites regular, they know uh, that they come in 50 pound bags. Um, they can come in bulk sacks for, uh, you know, very large jobs, but typically the guaranteed analysis is the N, P, and K in that bag of fertilizer. So nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And the nitrogen is what helps the plant grow. So think up, um, green growth, leaves, stems, et cetera. The, the middle number is uh, phosphorus or phosphate. And that is think of down because it helps root establishment. And the, the final number is uh, the all around number, potassium, because that just helps plant hardiness and disease resistance. So think up, down, all around. But that 10, 10, 10, um, that is a guaranteed analysis by a particular state. To sell fertilizer in most every state in America, you have to have that tag on the bag that says it's a 10, 10, 10 or 19, 19, 19, um, you know, or what's exactly in the bag. Now, with, with organic fertilizers and synthetic fertilizers, as we start to talk about you know, what those numbers mean, the 10, 10, 10, and the macronutrients and the micronutrients, what we'll get into in a minute. Um, this is a very generic uh, statement when talking about uh, fertilizers, but it, it, it's one that I think is, is good. You know, synthetic fertilizers are man-made, they feed the plant. Um, organic fertilizers are made from things like uh, compost, uh, manure, uh, things of that nature, and they feed the soil, which of course in turn feeds the plant. So organic fertilizers feed the soil and synthetic fertilizers feed the plant. And so as we talk about the essential elements in um, the bag of fertilizer, you have uh, macronutrients and micronutrients. You know, macronutrients are, are things like the N, P, and K, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that we saw, seeing the numbers right on the bag, and then magnesium, calcium, sulfur. And then the micronutrients nutrients are things like zinc, boron, iron. Um, so again, back to eighth grade or ninth grade, maybe whatever science it is, and that periodic table. Um, and, and these are the building blocks of plant life as we know it. Um, and to really get a little more into these, you know, we could talk about each one of these macro and micronutrients and what they do for plants for an hour. But again, we're just going to kind of talk about varying types of fertilizer and, and, and how they might be used on a job site. Um, the macronutrients are, are the primary ones are the N, P, and K. And they're, these are needed uh, in, in the highest amounts to grow plants or to help plants vegetate. The secondary uh, macronutrients are calcium, uh, magnesium, and sulfur. 
and they require lesser amounts, but uh, still a, a, a good uh, uh, amount of those to get plants up and running. And you can see what, you, what each one of these do. Um, one of the things I'll do is save this as a PDF um, and send it out to everyone who is attending. So if you want to really get in the weeds and read, you know, what magnesium does versus sulfur, if that's an interest to you, you can um, you can get, look into that. And then you have the micronutrients, the micronutrients, sometimes called minor nutrients or trace elements. You may buy a bag of fertilizer that has NPK with a trace uh, package in it. And that's what it means. It has micronutrients in it. And they appear lesser in the soil, but they're still important to plant growth. So you have things like boron, copper, uh, molybdenum, uh, manganese is an interesting one. If we have any Caddyshack fans on the uh, on the, uh, the call here today, um, if you remember uh, Ty Webb and and um, um, uh, the the greenskeeper there. Carl and Caddyshack when they're in the shed at night and, and uh, talking about how Carl wants to be a greenskeeper. He says, you know, chinch bugs and manganese. I'm learning about all these things. You know, that's actually what he's talking about. Manganese is a micronutrient for the soil. Um, so and then and when you talk about all these nutrients, you know, here's nitrogen, phosphorus and 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 uh, potassium, they really uh, work the best in the soil when the pH of the soil is between 5.5 and 7. You know, that's a broad number, but um, most pHs in most soils in the mid-Atlantic, you know, aren't that. So you use lime to raise the, the, the pH in the soil. You can use ag lime, or if you're using a hydroceter, you can use a, a powdered lime that goes in there. But pH is, um, you know, how acidic or basic a soil is, if you think back to those science classes. And um, the only th real thing uh, a liming application does is raise the pH of the soil. Um, so when you go to a, a garden center and buy fertilizer and lime in the fall, the lime is its only job really is to raise the pH of the soil. And again, if you look at all of those uh, micro and some of the, excuse me, macro and some of the micronutrients, you'll see here where that seven, 6.5 to seven finds a sweet spot where all of those nutrients can, can be, uh, can, can uptake into the plant from either the soil through the organic side or the synthetic side. So that's the importance of pH, you know, and when you're talking about um, a soil test, a soil test can go a long way. Some of you have, that have seen my webinars have seen this before. $16 can go a, a long way on a hundred million dollar project. Um, you know, a lot of times there's, there's just a cut and paste spec and we'll talk later on about why that is. Um, and, and what we're, we're talking about here is, is this is a, a place that we went out uh, and did a soil test and what it really needed was to raise the pH. Um, that was the main thing in the soil. The pH was very, very low and the folks had done a soil test, but they didn't really put down enough lime the first time. Um, so there are a couple kinds of soil tests that your, your local um, ag school, like in Virginia, we have Virginia Tech or North Carolina has NC State. Your local land grant institution usually does um, soil tests for everybody from farmers to contractors. And in this one, you can see across the top, the lab results give you the test of the um, macro and micronutrients. And on the second one, the soil pH in this instance, it's 5.4. And then it gives you a recommendation, a recommendation of how much lime you should use to put down in the soil to get the pH up to, in this instance, the buffer is 6.10. And then it gives you a recommendation on a one, two, one fertilizer, meaning like a five, 10, five, the term one, two, one down here in the bottom line indicates that the phosphorus should be double the nitrogen and potassium. So like a 5105 or 153015 or 102010 is, is very common, but they're also very uh, basic 
in a lot of ways, somewhat antiquated uh, analysis. And we'll talk a little bit more as to, um, you know, how you can, can really customize things on a job site. Um, here is one from Waypoint Analytical. Waypoint um, is really, I think, over most parts of the country. Um, they bought in the mid-Atlantic market. They bought a &L Labs recently. And so this is just a little more colorful. It's a little, some folks think it's easier to read. It gives you a bar graph there that, that shows the, the, um, uh, the, the nutrient is either being very low or all the way up to very high um, and how many parts per millions. This one has a soil pH of 5.6, I believe it is. And interestingly enough, in the bottom left-hand um, corner, um, it has a 4.0 organic matter. So this is actually some pretty rich soil, even though it has a low pH. Um, nitrogen is pretty much, is usually never tested on a soil test, but nitrogen is very volatile in the soil. So the, the soil test um, or the, the lab makes a recommendation on a, uh, how much nitrogen you need based on some of the other um, uh, things like different um, uh, cation exchange capacities and, and different ratios in the soil, um, and also how much uh, phosphorus and, and uh, potassium you need. So those are just uh, two quick um, examples of soil tests. So as you really start to think about those, um, that fertilizer and what it is and what those numbers mean, let's delve into that a little more. A lot of folks, you know, that have been dealing with fertilizer a long time really don't understand what these numbers mean. So again, if you look at this 10, 10, 10, I use that as a basic example because it's easy math. A 50 pound bag has 10% of nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, and 10% potassium. So 70% of that bag is, is a filler or a carrier agent. And what this equates to in that 50 pound bag is five pounds of nitrogen, five pounds of phosphorus, and five pounds of potassium, and then 35 pounds of filler. Well, the term filler sometimes sounds bad. It, it um, you know, you can't create a bag of 50 pounds of N, P, and K because it would be too volatile, um, any number of reasons. So think of the, the filler really more as a carrier. And so if you think, well, what is the carrier? Well, what does that mean? What else is in the bag? It could be any number of things. It could be um, um, sand, limestone, clay. Um, in the mid-Atlantic, oftentimes it's limestone or clay. It could be other things. It could be minerals. Um, typically, the um, you know less expensive the fertilizer, uh, the less helpful the um, or the less more aggregate there is, and, and less of things like clay or limestone in uh, in the bag. Um, but it depends a lot on what's available near the fertilizer plant, and also things like cost and any other number of factors. Um, as you really get into uh, large job sites or customizing fertilizer, just like you can customize the number is 10, 10, 10, you can customize what the filler or what the carrier is. So moving along and thinking that in, in mind, when you, when you talk about synthetic um, agricultural based or typically what we call ag grade fertilizers, because they're similar to what are used in agriculture, they have a prill size of 220 or more. Um, and to just give you a quick um, example of what the prill size is, and I'm saying P-R-I-L-L, -L, for, for folks that are laughing at my accent right now, but the prill size is how big the individual pellets, if you will, or you know, the, the prills and the, the fertilizer are. The higher the number, the larger the prill. So your typical ag-based fertilizer um, is, is a 220 prill. Now, a golf course superintendent, he's going to put um, maybe a hundred prill uh, fertilizer on a green so that you can barely see it and water it in really easy. But, you know, that that's a lot more expensive proposition and you really don't need that for a job site. I just use that as an analogy to explain, um, you know, what's in the fertilizer bag. And so these synthetic fertilizers, the nitrogen, nitrogen can be slow release. You know, there are ways that they can coat the fertilizer or, um, or, or, have the nitrogen release over time, which is a lot better for the plant. They can have 
additives like calcium, um, some of the other macronutrients, they can have trace elements in there as well. They can have soil conditioners added to the bag of fertilizers. They're very, very predictable and very reliable. And, and um, what I mean by that is that, you know, because of that guaranteed analysis by the state and because it's a typically a production run facility that is doing these, um, the 15, 30, 15, I mean, you're going to get 15 percent uh, in 30 percent P and 15 percent K in that bag. I mean, they're very reliable. Um, and they have numerous analysis options. What I mean by that is that, you know, warehouses might have a 18-24-6 or a 19-19-19. There's a lot of variety in the analysis, whereas typically um, organic fertilizers, while they have a lot of um, other benefits to the soil, uh, you know, they're, they're typically lower and they don't have a lot of options for N, P, and K because it's not manufactured. It's it's at the behest of what the cow or the chicken or sometimes a human is giving you in his waste and how much N, P, and K is in those things. Um, so um, when you talk about synthetic fertilizers, though, and how they treat the plant, and um, you know, and, and if you remember back to that original uh, first slide about the ideal soil profile, um, you know. The picture on the left is what a lot of folks talk about or think about when they start talking about topsoil and dirt and is large scale job site soil actually topsoil? Well, usually not. And that's why we look to other types of fertilizers that maybe uh, have more of a, an organic base so that when we put them down, we can um, we can not only uh, uh, feed the soil, try to change the soil or help the soil, but to feed the plant that way. Um, and to give you an example of that, uh, you know, an organic fertilizer amends the soil it, it, as the the um, as the organic uh, breaks down. It, it it helps with the tilth and the texture of the soil. Like I said, the the typically the the lower uh, NPK in the analysis, like this one on the screen, is a three four three. This is a um, a, a chicken manure, uh, an egg based com egg layer based compost. So it replenishes your organic matter in the soil, or if there's none there, it can add it. So it aids in the carbon cycle and the microbes that start to break down in the soil. And it really helps to get that soil alive again. And so one of the things, if you're using organic fertilizer that you might want to learn about is, is, you know, what does uh, organic mean? And so organic is very much a buzzword in our life today um, in, in everything that we do. I mean, um, when you go to the grocery store, you're looking at organic this or organic that. And so in the um, in the fertilizer world, there's some USDA organic uh, ways to plant. Um, some of the other things you, you might want to look into is Omri. This product is an Omri listed plant, which um, which is the organic manufacturers um, and I apologize, I can't remember the, the full, um, uh, you know, what all the, the letters mean, but, but that it's basically a certification for um, organic products. So there's several of them out there. It's something you may want to look into if you're interested in that sort of thing. Just understand that, um, you know, asking somebody, well, is it organic? Well, that's kind of like asking somebody, well, you know, are you religious? Well, that's kind of in the eye of the beholder in a lot of ways. Um, so understand that those out there and, and really understand that you're comparing apples to apples and not necessarily apples to oranges when you're talking about organic fertilizer. Some of the other benefits is that the, re the release of the nutrients are going to be slower over time. I'm talking about um, you know, six months to a year as this, uh, as the organic portion of this fertilizer breaks down in the soil. Some of the other neater things uh, about it in, in the contents of a large job site is that it's not going to burn plants. And what I mean by that is that synthetic fertilizers, if you put them down on uh, vegetation that's already established um, and you Put a little too much or you put it down and you don't get rain it could essentially burn the the plant and um because it gets too much nitrogen uh or too much uh, uh any of the nutrients 
per se on the um, on the leaf of the plant. So what I bring up to this, if you're thinking about, you know, in energy sectors or renewable energy sectors like uh, pipelines or solar farms or even landfills, um, and you have a stand of, of a reclamation mix that, you know, is doing OK, but you feel like you need to fertilize it. And the only time you can fertilize it is, you know, now in the summer, this would you know, an organic fertilizer is a great thing to use because it's not going to burn your plants. It's going to give uh, some slow release to the uh, to the to the soil, and you know it's going to change that that soil or help to work on that soil structure. And it's also they're less apt to be washed away in rainstorms because you know they because the organic matter can stay in place as it dissolves. And if you, if you are interested in this and want to learn more, you'll see the little text box down there on the bottom. One of our on-demand webinars online is a, a, a webinar that we did last year with um, the fellow from Earthworks. It's called Recycled Organic Matter for Poor Construction Job Sites. And we talk um, all about uh, you know, this product and how it's being used in, in job site applications. And so, one of the things you have to think about as well, or you have to understand if you're talking about organic fertilizer is different states have uh, different ways that organics go to market as compared to synthetic fertilizers. And some of them are soil amendments and some of them are fertilizers and understands that, that a soil amendment um, like a chicken compost or, or, a, or a manure compost or something like black cow, uh, is a good product out there some folks put in their garden understand that depending on the state you're in that may not have to have a guaranteed analysis because it's sold as a sold as a soil amendment and not a fertilizer and again just kind of understand that um, when you're when you're looking through things and and you know trying to understand what you're going to use on your job site and our granular applications are you know there's hadn't been a whole lot of uh real um uh nothing new really in how you put down granular fertilizer. You put it in a hopper and you put it behind a, a tractor on a job site. You know, they can be used in hydroceders, obviously, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But um, I did put the picture on the right there because I think interestingly enough, uh, with the rise of ATVs and uh, like uh, Polaris, is, I guess this is technically called a UTV on the right. Um, but um, I'm seeing a lot more of these being used on small one to three acre job sites. I think it's probably easier to get around. It's probably a lot easier to transport too if you're a seeding contractor or a general contractor and you've got a three acre site that you're working on that you need to seed and lime and fertilizer. You know, you can put this machine on a smaller trailer than you would typically the, uh, the full size tractor. So that's something that can consider as well and in in just thinking about putting this stuff out on job sites. And, you know, so we've talked about synthetic versus organic fertilizers and, and what the differences are. And typically we're talking about granular when we mention that. And there's also a lot of liquid fertilizers out there. And, and typically they haven't been used with job sites over the years, but as, as the uh, hydroseeding applications have increased, on both small and large job sites, liquid fertilizers are really um, kind of starting to take off in that are arena. A lot of uh, hydroseeders like it because it's easier on their hydroseeding equipment. As you can imagine, there's a pump that pumps the, the slurry out with all the stuff in it. And, you know, a liquid could be um, a little bit easier on the pump than say an, an old fashioned ag fertilizer that might have some limestone or something like that in it. Um, it's uh, it's you can add several different um, fertilizers to create a more exact analysis in the mix. Like um, if you needed something that isn't doesn't come straight off the shelf with your with your regards to your N, P and K, you can easily add that in the tank. It's um, it's convenient and sustainable. And what I mean by that is that, you know, a couple two and a half gallon jugs of fertilizer in a hydroceder might do the same as 20 bags of granular fertilizer. So that's why a lot of folks with hydroceders are moving to that because it's it's easier to store. It's easier to use. 
um, even though it is, um, you know, a plastic jug, I would say that there's there's less waste, if that makes sense. Um, and so hydroceders have been been um, trying to um, figure out liquid fertilizers for years. They've been doing trial and error um, things with by going and getting liquid fertilizer at farm stores. Some of them have a farming background even. Um, and they've been trying these things for a while. And one of the products that we've made is something specific for hydroceders where we take, um, you know, two liquid fertilizers, foundation and yield starter, and add uh, some soil conditioners to it in a product called Liberate. And then we, we use a, a tacking agent, a polyacrylamide tacking agent that um, is kind of binds it all together in the soil with the hydro mulch. Um, and this is really one of the newer uh, products out there with regard to liquid fertilizer for hydroceders. Um, and you can kind of see that that one of the benefits of liquid fertilizer in a hydroceder, a lot of people feel like, is you really can get good even uh, disbursement over the ground. Um, so you can see this is at a sediment basin and you can start to see 18 days after seeding, it, it's popped up uh, really well there. And here's another picture where you, uh, this is a either a sediment basement or what would eventually be a stormwater pond maybe. Um, and you can start to see the uniformity there of what a liquid fertilizer can do with um, a hydroceder. And so if you're interested in the HydroSmart uh, fertilizers more, there's another webinar on our um, website called Innovative Fertility Options for today's hydroceders. And it talks all about the HydroSmart Smart product and goes into a little more detail about applying them on uh, with the use of a hydroceder on, on large scale job sites. Um, the, the last thing I'd say about hydroceding is that it's, you know, a lot of people don't even realize you can actually, they see it spraying from the top of the hydroceder, but they have a hose and this is, you know, a lot of work um, and you have to have a good crew to do this, but the workability of a hydroceding and using that hose on not only small jobs, but large job sites, especially we're seeing a lot of solar in the mid-Atlantic and Ohio River Valley um, in the last years. And, and it seems to be um, you know, a lot scheduled for the future. And so a lot of folks are using hydroceders to go back and maybe hit some places that they've missed um, underneath panels or underneath the rays, things of that nature. Um, so, I, I, you know, we've talked about a, a couple different things here in, in traditional ag style fertilizers, you know, synthetic, organic. And so where do we really go from here and talk about, you know, what to use or how, who can help you figure out what to use on your job site? And I put these three bags up here because I would argue that most people, when they think about fertilizers, they think about the one on the left or in the middle. Um, you know, that's a big box store on the left. Scott's is a, a you know, a great company for um, for uh, residential home fertilizers, but but notice that they don't even put the the analysis on the front of the bag. I mean, we don't know what the N, P, and K is on that. Now, it's on there. It has to be by law. It's probably on a sticker on the back. Um, but you know, they're they're catering to a person who's coming in and and you know needs to know oh well this is start starter fertilizer for new grass that's what i need to put down and then the garden center um is maybe for a little more educated consumer sometimes what you typically see is a a retail point of purchase bag with but you do see the analysis in it that's got the 2027 five on there but understand that when you get um fertilizer at a job site it's going to be in a bag like what's on the right um, you know, it doesn't need to be a point of purchase bag that grabs your attention when you're coming in a store. You're, you're, they're shipping a pallet or two or three to a job site sometimes, you know, 50, 100, 150 bags. So as a construction um, uh, foreman or a seating company or, uh, you know, if you're an engineer on here trying to figure out, you know, what may be used on job sites, Understand that all of these um, fertilizer bags have got the analysis on it by law. And even the ones that are out there 
in at a job site delivery that are that are more basic, they're going to tell you everything about that fertilizer. Even the organic ones as well will tell you not only what the analysis is, but what it's derived from, um, any other additives that are in there. And if they're out on a job site or a lay down yard and you can't get to them, um, the place that, that sold you the fertilizer should very easily be able to send you either A, a tech sheet or B, a copy of the label that is on the fertilizer bag. And that can tell you, um, again, what you're dealing with out there. And so as you think about that, there's really all sorts of factors that go into deciding what to use on the job site. You know, things are specified um, from the civil engineer a lot of times in the erosion and sediment control or vegetation plan. But a lot of times that's cut and paste. And we'll talk about why in a minute. And then there's job site parameters like, you know, are you going to be bulk seeding? Are you going to be, uh, you know, how big it is, how small it is? Um, that's also what I would call um, where your soil test is should be done in the job site parameters. And then there's the economics of it as well. You know, I mean, fertilizers can be uh, expensive. Um, they can, some of the, the higher end ones that, that are out there on the market now, um, you've got to find one that's right for you, but that's also right for your, uh, for your budget. And lastly, you know, there's some, there's a governmental side of it. Um, some places you can only put down so much phosphorus um, when you only put, um, uh, new, new grass down because of, um, uh, Ches the Chesapeake, uh, Bay regulations. Um, and then there's other things like erosion and control handbooks. And let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, you know, this is a cut and paste from the Virginia erosion sediment and control handbook. And, you know, I'm not picking on Virginia here. Most states have redone their stormwater regs, but, there, most states in the Mid Atlantic and the, really the East Coast, uh, their their um, erosion control handbooks are pretty antiquated when it comes to fertilizer. And what I mean by that, it's just they just recommend a, a 10 20 10 or a 1 2 1 variety. You know that that's uh, and it, it, there's not a lot of availability of use per the handbook for a lot of the the newer fertilizers that are out there that have evolved. And so if you look at this and really read it, one of the neat things I like about it is that our handbook in Virginia is so, so old, they call Virginia Tech VPISU, which is Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. I'm sure we've got some Hokies out there. Um, if you, if you are, you know, tell us in the, uh, in the chat box and then, but it actually says, Fertilizer needs should be determined by soil tests. That's what we harp over and over again. But then, and this is on page three of, excuse me, 306 of part three. You can see down there, I cut and paste it. And, but then in most state handbooks, it says under unusual conditions where it is not possible to obtain a soil test, the following amendments shall be applied. And it's like a thousand pounds of, of, uh, of, uh, um, limestone and 500 or a thousand pounds of 10 20 10 very a very basic minimal application of fertilizer and again when these books were made consider the fact that uh most of the seeding were was being done in the fall or the spring um and it was on generally good soil um you know as we've as one of my engineer friends like to say, you know, we're not building on good dirt anymore. And what he means by that, if you look at the, the evolution of, a, of a, any given city in urban sprawl, and as we're starting to build stuff, there's less available land. So we're forced to build stuff on less fertile ground than we have in the past. And so what's happened here is these unusual conditions, you know, in every handbook where they've just become kind of the cut and paste spec for um, most um, job sites. And so that's what we have to work with or what we, um, what we really have to um, kind of try and that's really the challenge I should say, is that oftentimes cut and paste specifications with regards to fertilizer are put in there. And then, um, you know, the, the local inspectors or um, general contractors wanna use a handbook and it's really, um, you know, not always, easy to, to, to get a change in that regards. And so a lot of what's happened 
as a result of that are these vegetative management plans. And here's an example of one that we did, a draft. We do these for large scale sites um, like landfills and, and uh, solar farms and energy sectors and things like that, where we go out and do a soil test. And then we'll actually come in and make fertility recommendations and, and what to seed and how much fertilizer and what kind of fertilizer. And what this does is, is it actually, it actually, it can be used by the general contractor or by the owner or in the solar farm world in the mid Atlantic, what we're seeing is a lot of EPCs using these, um, these vegetation management plans to try to get some accountability with the, the GC and the subcontractor uh, to, to get grass grown. And, you know, it's, again, it's, it's, it's not the, the, GC or the subcontractor's fault if the grass doesn't grow. Um, you know, they may not have a soil test. They may be just working off a spec, like I said, that was out there that's very antiquated. Um, so what it does, it just kind of uh, brings in all of the things we talked about and it addresses a lot of the challenges with seeding and fertility. Um, and um, like I said, a lot, of, uh, a lot of folks are using these on larger job sites in and around uh, the mid-Atlantic, especially in solar, we're seeing a lot of EPCs come in and, and have uh, vegetation management plans. Actually, a lot of large solar developers are actually have a vegetation specialist on, on staff now, and several of them, if you see on LinkedIn, are, are looking for somebody in that role to hire. Um, and in that vegetation management plan, obviously fertilizer would be a big part of that fertilizer, lime, seed and um, how they're how it's applied and when all of those parameters that could make a challenging job site a successful one. So that's um, kind of short and sweet um, wrap up again. It was very um, kind of a what I like to call a 10,000 foot view of of fertilizers on job sites. Um, I've seen from the, some of the um, uh, comments here that, that folks thought it was helpful, kind of the breakdowns and what's in the bag and things of that nature. And I'll give it a minute now. And uh, if you want to um, chime in with any questions, let me know if you have any. Um, and what we'll also do is for those of you who are new, we'll talk about our, our um, or we're waiting for questions to come in. We'll talk about our PDH system. If you go to that website right there, which is basically our website and a PDH at the end, it takes you to a, uh, a place where you can input your name and a little bit of information. And then you use that code 20712. And in a day or so, you'll get a PDH uh, email to you. And so we've got a question that comes up about bulk, excuse me, about bulk fertilizer. Does that change the N, P, and K if you get it bulk? Well, yes and no. It, it, it doesn't have to change it. But if you have a bulk bag of fertilizer, um, you have, uh, they're typically 1,000 pounds or 2,000 pound totes like are used in, in the agricultural settings. And they can be used on large job sites. And so if you want it to be 10, 10, 10, it could be that. But, you know, if you a lot of times because they're putting it in the totes and they haven't already put it in the bag, that's a little um, uh, easier to get a custom mix. So you could really have the analysis to be whatever you want it to be. Um, another question somebody uh, sent to me was about uh, VDOT approvals. Um, or, or state approvals other than, um, you know, the handbooks? That's a good question. So a lot of, uh, a lot of fertilizers are used on, may be in DOT handbooks instead of, or, or DOT materials listings instead of, um, you know, erosion control handbooks. That's a, that's a great point. All right. Any other questions chime in? Doesn't seem to be a few of them. Let me look here. All right, folks. Well, my info is there on the right as well. If you think of questions or have any questions, certainly um, let me know. Reach out to us if you have uh, job site concerns or if you have a large job site and want us to put together one of those fertility plans for you or a vegetation management plan. That's something that we can do. Um, and again, I appreciate it and I'll sign off now. 
and look for a, a, a follow-up email with these slides tomorrow and get those PDHs if you need them. Thanks so much for joining in. Uh, I appreciate it. And we'll be back um, in August. See y'all later.